Good morning. I would like to uh, welcome everyone to the conference Museum of Avant-Garde, or Avant-Garde Museum, Collecting the Radical. Uh, particularly, I would like to welcome our speakers. We have fantastic uh, uh, scholars and museum professionals here from Sweden, Spain, Russia, United States, and Poland. And I'm really grateful to all of you uh, that you accepted our invitation uh, to contribute to this conference. Uh, welcome also our, our faithful uh, audience. I see here some colleagues from other museums in Poland. Uh, uh, welcome Agnieszka uh, uh, Morawiecka, the director of National Museum uh, in Warsaw. Thank you that you decided to devote your free weekend and join us. Uh, the conference, uh, which I have uh, the pleasure to open, uh, ends the celebrations of the 100th anniversary of avant-garde in Poland. The project has been initiated by our museum, along with National Museum in Warsaw uh, and National Museum in Krakow. But within, uh, but within the year, nearly 100 other uh, institutions and organizations from all over the country have joined it. Among them, uh, major museums, universities, philharmonics, uh, theaters, but also galleries, culture clubs, schools, etc. The centenary has been celebrated not only in the metropolises, but also in small town, towns through organizing festivals, exhibitions, concerts, theater performances, conferences, seminars, as well as educational activities, workshops, and community projects. The main goal of this centenary was to manifest that avant-garde is an integral part of our heritage. And that means the idea of heritage is much more complex than some politicians and ideologists would like it to be. Uh, now it is far too early to evaluate these effects, uh, but I do hope that thanks to all those efforts, awareness uh, of the importance of avant-garde for our culture will increase at least a little. Uh, it is not the aim of this conference, however, to recapitulate this centenary. And the conference should be seen rather as another stage in the process that was started in our museum a few years ago and is still being continued. It is a process of rethinking our history, actualizing our legacy, and translating it into ideas and actions that could be relevant today. As you know, the history of our institution is closely related to the history of modern avant-garde. Uh, and it is not only because our museum houses one of the most important collections of the avant-garde art, but also because of the fact that it was avant-garde artists who shaped our museum to a large extent. Moreover, the museum was established, in a sense, as a tool for achieving avant-garde objectives. This legacy, uh, this legacy imposes on us a very special responsibility. It obliged us to think about our institutions not only as a museum of avant-garde art, as many in the world, but first and foremost as an avant-garde museum. What does it mean to be avant-garde museum? We try to demonstrate by means of our collection displays, exhibitions, publications, as well as educational and public programs. On, that, on the other hand, however, we are still looking for new ideas, models, and solutions. This is why this conference is so important for us. I'm sure it will bring a very inspirational exchange of thoughts, and I hope not only for us, but also for all participants. Once again, thank you for coming. Uh, I also uh, very much thank Adam Mickiewicz Institute, who is our partner and meaningfully supported organization of this uh, conference. Welcome, Zofia uh, Machnicka, uh, the representative of the Institute. Uh, Zosiu, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll speak very briefly. I just wanted to welcome you on behalf of the Adam Mickiewicz Institute which is a national cultural institution whose main mission is to promote Polish culture abroad and to communicate uh, the cultural dimension of Poland through an active international exchange. That is why we very gladly joined the uh, Museum of Art in Łódź in organizing this conference, since we believe this is a very important place uh, for the Polish 
heritage and for the nation, uh, international heritage, uh, cultural heritage. And we believe that the legacy of the avant-garde is still a very important question to address. So thank you and I wish you a very fruitful uh, two-day conference. Thank you very much. I'm the last in, in line today. I would also like to express my gratitude for you guys for joining us, uh, our lovely participants. And uh, just briefly a few practical uh, information. I would like to, um, uh, yeah, uh, please, if you need to uh, access uh, this room while the presentation is uh, going on, please use the back door because we will be recording it. So please do not disturb uh, the recording. Uh, we will start with three presentations um, before lunch, and after those three, it will be Grupa OK, Jeremy Braddock, and Daniel Muzichuk. We will invite you for a short uh, Q&A, all, all of you together, if it's OK. <laughs> uh, and after lunch, we will hear two more presentations by Rebecca Yuchil and Francisco uh, Godoy Vega, and then we will, be, we will screen the Desert of Forbidden Art uh, documentary. So I would like to uh, welcome first uh, Julian Meyers and Janna Szupinski. Floor is yours. and Agnieszka Pindera for the invitation and of course Agata Szynkielewska for all your organizational work that made this so smooth. Yes, thank, thank you. This uh, institution and the people who uh, are involved with it have been an immense inspiration to us um, half a world away um, for many years now and um, it's truly an honor. Um, so uh, what we will present today is um, a little bit distinct in format from the work that we do as individuals. Um, we collaborate um, under the title Grupo OK, of course, um, you know, under the inspiration of the founders of this institution. Um, th when we collaborate, um, uh, t individually we work as scholars, but when we work together um, under the title Grupo OK, um, we are required to inhabit uh, quite a strange rhetorical position, um, which you'll get a little bit of uh, flavor for right now. So wither the avant-garde in late 2017. A century has passed since the October Revolution and the Cabaret Voltaire, and 60 years since the newness of the neo-avant-garde. 40 years separate the present from the melancholic assertions of conservative critic Hilton Kramer, who wrote in The Age of the Avant-Garde that, quote, the myth of avant-garde opposition has come to an end, and the will to innovation no longer has any radical functions to perform. Four decades have gone by since the publication of The Postmodern Condition by Jean-Francois Lyotard, 1979, and 36 years since Rosalind Krauss argued that the originality of the avant-garde was but one more modernist myth. Those of us who encountered the avant-gardes of the early 20th century in the 1990s therefore met these groups across an unspeakable distance. The avant-garde came to us as if salvaged from an ancient shipwreck. It was broken into shards encrusted with discursive barnacles, ideologies, re re repudiations, reputations, publications, and prefixes, post, proto, neo, and trans. At the end of the century, the early 20th century avant-garde were perceived as if from the other side of a long tunnel. Dada arrived in our universe in mediated form by way of Grail Marcus's lipstick traces, um, by way of the Sex Pistols and the Situationist International. Hugo Ball's Dada Diary, Flight Out of Time, read from photocopies, seemed to us like the Bible, that is, a book both holy and remote. Arthur Rambeau, child saint of the avant-garde, we read first through Kathy Acker's misquotations in her novel, In Memoriam to Identity. 
a book that was reviewed as more postmodern blather from the queen of punk fiction. Um, another review called it a secret historiography on the psychosocial trauma of our time. Seen from the perspective of the United States in the wake of the collapse of the Soviet Union, the constructivists were an even more alluring and alien prospect. We searched out clues in the postage stamped uh, the, we searched out clues in the postage stamp sized reproductions in Christina Lauder's Russian Constructivism, which was published in 1983. Of course, I didn't read it until sometime in the 1990s because I was uh, a child. Um, I was not that cool. Um, and then came the deluge, um, the Guggenheim survey, The Great Utopia in 1992. Like Camilla Gray's book um, in the 1960s, The Great Experiment, um, The Great Utopia spurred a new generation of scholarship around figures like Rodchenko, Malievich, Stepyanova, and Popova. But unlike The Great Experiment, fewer American artists were inspired to engage with what The Great Utopia taught them. The Great Utopia would have been my first opportunity to see works by Katarzyna Kobro and Władysław Streminski. The work included Two incredible works by Kobro, um, The Suspended Construction uh, of 1921 and 2, and Abstract Sculpture 1 from 1924. Um, the latter uh, was borrowed from this museum, and both works are on view at MS1. Streminsky's works, uh, post-Cubist assemblages owing something still to Picasso and Tatlin, were harder to mark out um, than Kobro from the exhibition's overwhelming profusion. All of this was a long time ago and very far away. And that, in essence, is my point. The discursive position of the avant-garde in the late 20th century was one of closure. The age of the avant-garde was understood to be long over. This moment, and we can now comprehend it as the denouement of postmodernism, made room for a wide range of critical postmodernisms, uh, sorry, critical postmortems on the avant-garde. Um, these came from the right, from Hilton Kramer, among others, and from the left, um, in particular, feminist considerations from Griselda Pollock, Linda Nochlin, um, rest in peace, um, and others. This era allowed room for secret histories of the sort proposed by Lipstick Traces or Kathy Acker, or um, a figure who was deeply influential on, uh, on us, uh, Susan Buck Morse. Um, these, uh, these books uh, were formally, uh, these books and writers were formally experimental. Um, they drew old figures into uh, disruptive new constellations. Everything was finished, and so whatever was permitted. History was cheap. It could be raided and rearranged. It is still not clear to me whether this melancholic postmodernism faded after the year 2000, or if it was universalized. Certainly, around 2000, the mood changed. What happened next was a revival of the avant-garde, now with less tragedy or irony. In the context of Anglophone history, there was a divergence of paths. There was, on the one hand, a renewed field of scholarly production around the avant-garde. Eschewing melancholia, these art historians pitted the political stances of avant-gardes against a contemporary art seen as apolitical, or they measured the avant-garde's utopianism against the ascendance of global capitalism, a global capital, capital in which there was seen to be no contemporary alternative, in the famous words of Margaret Thatcher. Negatively construed in the postmodern moment, the avant-garde, along with connected terms like utopia and collectivism, reappeared in a positive light with the so-called global turn. We might take as a signal moment of that uh, global turn the exhibition Inverted Utopias, Avant-Garde Art in Latin America, which was curated by Mary Carmen Ramirez and Hector Olea in 2004. This exhibition deployed the concept of the avant-garde freed from the agita that had attended the term in the late 20th century. 
compare the ease of Ramirez's usage, for example, to the grinding effort expended by Paul Wood's introduction to the Great Utopia 12 years earlier. Paul Wood spent half of his very long essay extricating the Soviet avant-garde from accusations of apoliticism on the one hand and complicity with Stalinism on the other. By 2004, such problems seemed to have vanished. The expanded geography of modernism sanctioned the return of an avant-garde in a purified version, cleansed of the stains of Stalinism, Eurocentrism, revolution, and war. Part two, anti-museum. Where now for the avant-garde? Not so long ago, the conjunctions made by the title of this conference between the avant-garde and the museum, radicalism and collections, would have been seen as deeply counterintuitive, if not outright contradictory. Museums, so it goes, separate art from life. They reify the historical past and thereby stifle new creativity. They monopolize and enclose works that are the common heritage of humanity, as if they were possessions of elites. For these reasons and others, museums are perceived as anathema to radicals, including many members of the avant-garde. Periods of revolutionary agitation have often included the destruction or expropriation of works of art and the demolition of museums. Artistic avant-gardes call for the destruction of museums or cast them as cemeteries. Article 10 of the Futurist Manifesto famously begins, we want to demolish museums and libraries and feminism and et cetera, et cetera. Um, during the Russian Civil War, Malievich uh, famously argued the Communist Party not to guard old museums and art collections, arguing they stood in the way of new forms of creation. He also suggested that uh, perhaps artworks should be burned and their ashes compiled in a pharmacy so that people could uh, take a pill or snort a line of uh, an, the entire oeuvre of uh, an artist's work if they felt nostalgic. Such an inventory of anti-museum sentiment could obviously go on. So familiar is this anti-pathetic pose that it has recently served as the premise of a vast anthology edited by Matthew Copeland and, Copeland and Balthasar Love, a compilation of anti-museum sentiments, the anti-museum and anthology. Anyway, so goes the cardboard cliche. But it turns out that iconoclasts often believe quite deeply in what they set out to destroy. In her 1972 essay, Museums and Radicals, art historian Linda Nochlin drew on the historical record to make clear just how truly ambivalent the relationship between museums and revolutionary agitation has been. Her main examples, being a French scholar, are French. The 1789 revolution saw the expropriation of works from church and aristocracy and the establishment of the Louvre to house them for the public good. With the expulsion of King Louis Philippe in 1848, a new generation of radicals rushed the Louvre and created an encampment among the pictures, but were dissuaded from actually destro destroying them by a fellow Republican. This revolutionary government soon came to administer the museum rather than destroy it, as the Palais du Peuple. When the communards took over Paris in 1871, they tore down a monument celebrating Napoleon's victories, but appointed Gustave Courbet chair of the art commission and charged him with protecting the city's artworks from fire and theft, which he did. So if some radical artists sought to shed the past, Nochlin argues, others aimed to preserve it. Some artists aimed to bring their creativity to bear more directly on life itself, leaving behind art and its institutions. Others saw institution building as a crucial form of advocacy for a more just and modern world. Should one destroy museums or render them common property for all? Nochlin makes clear that radicals have not been unified in this matter. 
Her account therefore complicates our expectations about the negative relationship between radicals and museums. Indeed, one could argue that the avant-garde today depends on institutional mediation, exists precisely in and through radical museology. That is, the global avant-garde lives on and in and through the history of its mediation, the history of exhibitions and institutions. These qualifications, however, should not lead us to assume the opposite case. To imagine that institution building was ever an altogether natural thing for avant-garde to do. And we, Grupa OK, would guess that counterintuitive counter and contradictory might remain relevant adjectives in the discussions to come. So I have in the last several minutes been jumping around quickly, staring at broken pieces and wondering if a pattern might emerge or if any uh, pattern will appear at all. We will not continue at this restless pace. Um, instead, we'll set aside momentarily the matter of the avant-garde and think now about the formation of museum collections. To do so, we will consider as a case study an exhibition that Joanna curated at the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago called First 50. Um, we will return thereafter to the avant-garde and its history. In the history um, of the reception of the avant-garde that Julian has sketched out for us, a kind of slipperiness emerges, an inability to pin down one truly cohesive narrative about the avant-garde. I'd like to turn now to the other term put forward by this conference, the museum collection. Lest we think we'll find some security in this construction, I would like to question the collection as an inherently coherent or unified thing. So let's turn to my case study, the beginnings of the collection of the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago some 50 years ago. Though it is not a collection of avant-garde work as such, I believe that a glimpse into its formation will help us understand the nature of collections as well as productively to destabilize the notion of museum collections. First 50 constructed a narrative of the early years of the MCA by using a simple framework. As the title implies, I studied the first 50 artworks that entered the museum collection and displayed them in the order of their acquisition. It may have been a simple idea, but it opened quickly onto more complex matters. These objects, I quickly discovered, uh, were acquired before the museum had formed a permanent collection committee or collection protocols, and indeed before the multiple players that shaped the institution in its early days had decided whether the museum was to have a collection at all. The first accession numbers were therefore assigned to objects acquired during six years of collecting by an institution that was, nominally, not collecting. These first objects therefore amount to a sort of proto or anti-collection. Of these works, only a few have been shown in any exhibitions other than this one. The majority remain in storage, um, largely unseen. Among the first 50 works are artworks by widely recognized artists such as Enrico Bage, Alexander Calder, and Chuck Close, works by artists somewhat overlooked by art history, like the Italian artist Gianfranco Baruccello, and uh, totally unexpected objects such as a figure carved from whalebone. I will not narrate each of the, the 50 works uh, in detail, of course, but will present a selection that will enable us to understand the reality of collecting uh, through three concepts, origin myths, collecting without a plan, and finally, ejection. I know that curators and registrars in the room can attest to the familiarity they'll recognize in these stories and surely will have their own anecdotes to contribute to this thinking. Let us begin with the origin myth. Any institution that touts the importance of their collection eventually must craft a story of its formation. At the California Museum of Photography, where I am now, uh, we maintain the world's largest collection of stereographic material. And the story involves two big rig trucks full of glass plate negatives driving cross country to California from the East Coast. That's the sort of origin myth I'm talking about. At MCA Chicago, the story was streamlined as follows. From its founding in 1967, as a radical alternative to the Art Institute of Chicago, the MCA was a non-collecting institution until 1974, when a collection committee was formed. 
Um, but you'll notice the, the session number here shows us 68. So what's going on? Uh, the first director, Jan Vandermark, uh, a radical from the Netherlands, had envisioned a museum, uh, the museum as a Kunsthalle that would emphasize the presentation of temporary exhibitions and experimental events. But the myth acknowledges a few anomalies, like this work, Six Women, which was donated in 68 by the artist Marisol, now best remembered for exactly this kind of sculptural figurative work. Um, and this ma major work held in the collection reveals a crack in the origin story. Uh, so we often hear the, the myth, you know, the, the museum didn't have a collection, but there were a few things. So I was curious about those first few things, uh, but I d and when I investigated, I discovered nearly 50, most of them unacknowledged by the official story. For her part, uh, Marisol had storage issues. It's a big sculpture, um, and insisted the museum take her donation. And so they accepted it as an unrestricted gift. Um, so this is the condition that it could be sold. In 1972, it was nearly sold, uh, to the Museum of Art at the University of Iowa, uh, but the director at MCA couldn't finally bring himself to sell it. So the wor work remains in the MCA and is retroactively heralded as a foundational collection work. To my mind, it is embl emblematic of a, of a sort of unplanned but lucky acquisition. It's a significant work by an important American woman artist of Latin American descent, and looking back half a century later, uh, we can understand a sort of auspicious beginning. There are other unplanned works in that early collection, and not all of them were donated by the artists. Another work that has never been exhibited before 50, uh, first 50 is, on first glance, a, a quite a puzzling anomaly. Spirit is a sort of charming, scowling figure, about this big, uh, carved from petrified whale bone, created by Nicodemus Nauyuk, an artist from Northeast Canadian Inuit territories. In the past, the work was assessed by the collection committee and the curators as not appropriate to the scope of MCA's collection. It is not exactly our task to speculate why and whether this assessment has or should change, which I think, uh, given you know, the current moment, it, it perhaps will. Um, in fact, I optimistically think that today the discussion might look different. But the question today is, um, if it has been deemed inappropriate, why is it still there? I was surprised to find that many of the works among the first 50 acquisitions were explicitly donated for the benefit of art auctions organized by the MCA's Women's Board to fund museum operations. So this is something very familiar to the Americans in the room. Um, you know, museums are often funded by private funds. However, many of the donations uh, were not put up for sale in the auctions. So we have a situation where a work is donated for an auction sometimes isn't even good enough for the auction, but then enters the museum collection. It's, it's quite <laughs> perverse. Mm. Um, so some were seen as too minor to include the, in the auctions or were excluded for other reasons. But many of those details uh, have, were not recorded and have been lost uh, to time and failing memories. Today, such donations would be classified as non-collection items. In 1973, however, in a rather consequential maneuver, works that had been donated to the auctions were retroactively accessioned by well-meaning registrar, meaning they were assigned collection numbers instead of organizing them in some other way, uh, for instance, with inventory numbers. Spirit was gifted uh, for the 1973 benefit auction by a local gallery, um, but was not included. And I discovered last night that uh, Daniel is actually a lawyer by training, so uh, hopefully we'll appreciate these, these details. Um, so then the, the work was formally logged by the registrar, as you can see, 1973.29, making it officially part of the museum collection. So while the museum did not have a collection committee or regulations until the following year, it now had a collection. I cannot underscore enough what a significant decision this was. Simply by assigning a number, works were locked into museum standards and, and protocols for decades, and still are. The MCA long felt that this work did not belong, as I mentioned, which brings us to the issue of shaping a collection. 
Collections are created by amassing works, often to great celebration, uh, but also, and this usually discreetly, by selling off works that are minor, redundant, as in duplicate editions, or not serving the mission of the institution. As H Helen Goldenberg, one of the MCA trustees, told me, deaccessioning is a controversial thing, but it's something that every institution does. And it's not only something they need to do, but probably should do. It is always a little controversial, but it's part of being a contemporary institution. The object file devoted to this sculpture is thick and reveals to us some of the difficulties. Spirit was approved for deaccessioning in 1980 and has been reconsidered by the collection committee numerous times over the decades since. On several occasions, research has been conducted on potential deaccessioning avenues, including galleries dealing in Inuit art. However, there are several technicalities that pose problems for deaccessioning spirit, and so it remains in the collection. First, the work cannot be shipped outside of the US because of its natural material, the, the petrified whalebone. Surprisingly, that's the least of its problems. Another thread in the archive reveals extensive correspondence with NAGPRA, which is um, the National American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, a 1990 American law that provides for the protection of Native American graves and other things. In the late 90s, the MCA clarified that while Spirit was made by a native Eskimo, the work is a contemporary artwork created by a contemporary artist and should not qualify under NAGPRA protections. So again, we see you know, at, at the meetings, they're saying this is not contemporary, this is an indigenous artwork and uh, we should deaccession it. But when it comes to talking to NAGPRA, the national organization, they're saying, oh no, it's contemporary. You know, please take us off your list. <laughs> So for several years, the MCA received governmental requests and surveys regarding NAGPRA compliance, and MCA sent letters in response requesting that the museum be removed from the register. Finally, I'll, I'll take you back to the, to the list here, uh, the caption. Uh, of great consequence, the signed deed of gift form stipulates that if the work is not sold at the 73 auction, it must be returned to the donor. Uh, meanwhile, the gallery that donated it Gimple and Weizenhofer no longer exists. So here again, we see a minor technicality uh, that, that has real consequences. The museum must store and care for this object that has little prospect of being exhibited, uh, deal with legal paperwork that, uh, you know, required by NAGPRA and so on, all because first, it was not included in the auction for which it was donated, second, it was assigned a collection number, and uh, finally, third, the donor contract stipulated it should be returned to a donor that no longer exists. Other works have been successfully deaccessioned. In fact, only 19 of the original 50 objects remain in the collection, which means 31 works have been unloaded. Many were donated explicitly for auction, then erroneously given accession numbers, of, as we've seen, creating years of work for the museum that included caring for the works, keeping inventory, moving them when the museum changed locations, and so on. The process of deaccession is no easy task either, including justification to the committee, voting by the board, and identifying potential buyers. While they had been intended as unrestricted gifts for the auction, the proceeds of which would go toward operational expenses, the profits made from works uh, that are deaccessioned from the so-called permanent collection are restricted toward the use of the collection itself, so another sort of stipulation. Here you can see the sculpture um, in the display case. It was the 39th uh, work in the collection of 50. And as I mentioned, the works uh, were installed in linear order of acquisition. So number 38 to its left um, of the vitrine is a screen print by a Croatian artist called Marcos Palatin. It was donated, um, uh, you know, it was also listed in, on an auction agenda, but didn't sell and so ended up in the permanent collection. Um, but has never been shown at the museum other than this once. Um, all the other works that you see here, um, represented by these black frames, are, have been deaccessioned. Um, so all I've included are, you know, the, what is in the file. So often a photograph of the work in storage, just a snapshot, a Polaroid. Um, 
by the by the early 80s this is what i call the great purge or ejection um, by the early 80s the collection committee had been operating for a few years and the museum undertook a much needed reassessment of the collection a group of works including this lovely painting of flowers by Dartel, and we're missing the artist's full name even, um, were finally deaccessioned. So I'll, I'll allow myself the indulgence just very quickly to show you some of the highlights from the deaccessioned works. I won't tell you about each one, um, although I've totally fallen in love with, with every single one. Um, but <laughs> I just feel that it, it is customary to be shown the, the sort of proud highlights of collections, but we never get to see uh, the things that have been ejected. So in addition to paintings of flowers, we have lovely seascapes, um, as well as more abstract works, um, like these two works on paper by Jacques Chimay, also donated for an early auction. So those are just some, some highlights. But, but our question today is, given all the difficulties of managing a collection, why did they do it? Why does anyone do it? Um, by, stay, by staying with our case study just for one more moment, uh, perhaps we can think about this question in a way that relates to modern and contemporary art collections more broadly. The debate at the early MCA revolved around whether the museum should remain a contemporary and nimble Kunsthalle presenting innovative exhibitions or whether they should grow up and also be a collecting institution. Some board members were concerned that the museum would be paralyzed by contractual restrictions, eventually having to keep and care for works that would not pass the test of time, as indeed we've seen. But others evoked civic pride, saying that all the great private collections of contemporary art in Chicago would leave to New York museums should the MCA not start collecting. Others saw a collection as stabilizing for the institution. In the words of Louis Manilow, the collection committee's first chairman, you cannot keep an institution recreating everything all the time. I hear in his statement an echo of Swedish curator Pontus Sulten, who in a conversation with Hans Ulrich Obrist argues for the protective nature of permanent collections. The collection is the backbone of an institution. It allows it to survive a difficult moment. The day someone decides it's too expensive, it's all over. Everything is lost almost without a trace. There will be a few catalogs, and that's it. The vulnerability of it all is terrifying. As we know, ultimately the MCA did institutionalize its collecting activities. In looking through the first 50 objects, 1974 is that clear turning point. Once the MCA Board of Trustees set about consciously building a collection, important work started entering the collection in a more consistent and systematic fashion. In that year, the collector Albert Bildner made a donation of several works by artists associated with the Chicago Imagists that you see on screen. Works by Roger Brown, Philip Hansen, Gladys Nielsen, Ed Paschke, Christina Ramberg, Barbara Rossi, and Ray Yoshida. These works had been on view as part of the traveling exhibition made in Chicago, which represented the US in the 12th Sao Paulo Biennale. The works continue to be shown at the MCA and elsewhere marking the initi initiation of concerted collecting as opposed to the Marisol sculpture and all the other works that came organically before 1974, the Bildner donation is a second beginning. Two paintings from the Bildner group by Ed Paschke, Elsina and Lucy, conclude first 50 as the 49th and 50th objects to be granted as session numbers, inaugurating the MCA's conscious collecting. Compared to the collection that followed, with its many strengths, from surrealism to conceptual photography, the works that came before may at first appear an eclectic or even random assortment, a collection that has not yet earned the name. Their provenance was certainly anything but systematic. They were assembled thanks to unsolicited gifts from artists like Marisol, auction items that were erroneously accessioned, and the generosity of many other donors who were invested in the project of building and sustaining the museum. Nevertheless, these artworks do have an order, one consolidated of the sequence of accession numbers, which in turn reflect the story of the institution itself, one that both reveals and at times excludes them. In The Order of Things, Michel Foucault suggests that ancient ordering systems, which can seem unintelligible to us now, 
quote, can be posited as the most fundamental of all, anterior to words, perceptions, and gestures. More solid, more archaic, less, less dubious, always more true than the theories that attempt to give those expressions explicit form. So, so too does this proto-collection hold a fundamental order. Joanna's case study has located for us some component operations of museum collections. The origin myth, the introduction of protocols and plans, and then the use of these protocols to govern accession and deaccession. That is, what is enclosed by the, by the collection and what ejected from it. And she's pointed to how such systems of objects generate within themselves strange surpluses and blank spots. In such figurative or real spaces, one finds nagging remainders like Nicodemus Naoyuk's carved whalebone, real things that the museum cannot be rid of, but can neither be allowed to enter the order of the collection as such, or not without fundamentally changing the order itself, what it protects and what it discards. What First 50 described was the contingencies and the constitution of the collection as such. I promised that our conclusion would return to the matter of the avant-garde. In doing so, we should admit that we're skeptical and maybe even disaffected by many of the term's essential overtones. Notwithstanding our, uh, our name's reference to Grupa AR, we are not nostalgists. We don't wear rose-colored glasses. The avant-garde's root association with militarism, a small, especially violent band that will lead the main forward charge into battle, this excites us not at all. Few today would argue that the avant-garde's twin phenomenon of the political vanguard, that is, an elite party who will, through sovereign violence, decide the future, or return us to one ideological fantasy or another, few would argue that this will lead anywhere great. Real terrorism is an abomination. Today, aesthetic terrorism is YouTube. So let's go down the list. Newness sounds old fashioned. Disruption is now a corporate strategy. Shock is an ad man's technique. Experimentation, no thank you. <laughs> what else? We remain interested in the avant-garde as a form of internationalism. We remain interested in the avant-garde as a group formation. It was an odd discovery of writing this presentation that we found that the conjunction of the avant-garde and the collection inspired us to recognize that the cultural formation of the avant-garde may in fact mirror the logic of the collection itself. What is an avant-garde but a collection of people? people who together produce a mythic origin, who introduce to their grouping some program of relation, both among the individuals that constitute the group and for the larger social world, who then use that plan to govern the grouping itself, to absorb apostles and eject traitors, accessioning and deaccessioning. This is a strange game of ours, our tendency to see artworks as surrogate people and people as animated objects. Taken in this sense though, the avant-garde collection may be only an encrypted image or miniaturization of those that produced it and their path through the world. That is, as whole or broken, visionary, uh, as whole or broken, visionary or misshapen as the lives that assembled it. What then distinguishes an avant-garde collection from any other sort of collection generated among a group? We could, Im we could imagine it on the terms that the avant-garde might set for itself. An avant-garde collection might be negative. What would count as a negative collection? Perhaps the liquidation or destruction of an existing collection or the purposeful disordering of a given system of objects. Maybe it would be a museum with anti in the title. <coughs> like the, uh, something like Ernst Friedrich's anti-war museum in 1920s Berlin. 
the museological embodiment of the pacifist philosophy of war against war. Such a museum might want to end the thing it represents. Or an avant-garde museum might be proleptic. It would not only anticipate a future, but dwell in it as if it had already happened. In the future perfect, this will have been. Would this be uh, Alexander Dorner's room of the present, for example? Or what? What to make of this Janus-faced institution, negating and projecting, dreaming through erasing? But perhaps thinking about things in this way is crazy. Maybe such a collection and such an avant-garde is impossible. So in the interest of being of use to those around us, let us resolve with a fragment or a plea for the discussions to come. Here's a definition of the avant-garde from 1981 one that seems more or less correct and reasonable to us. It comes from Griselda Pollock and Fred Orton, um, an essay called Avant-Garde's and Partisans Reviewed. It's the first paragraph of that essay. And they write, an avant-garde does not simply emerge ready-made from virgin soil to be attributed a la mode. It is actively formed and it fulfills a particular function it is the product of a self-consciousness on the part of those who identify themselves as and with a special social and artistic grouping within the intelligentsia at a specific historical conjuncture. The avant-garde is not a process inherent in the evolution of art in modern times. The avant-garde is not the motor of spiritual renovation and artistic innovation. An avant-garde is a concrete history. An avant-garde is a concrete cultural phenomenon that is realized in terms of identifiable practices and representations through which it constitutes for itself a relationship to and a distance from the overall cultural patterns of the time. Moreover, the avant-garde provides the terms of reference by which artists can see themselves in this illusory but effective mode of difference and by which others can validate what they are producing as somehow fulfilling an avant-garde's function. Thank you. <laughs>